So, hi guys, Tim here. Going to do another um, military video for you today. And um, sorry, I haven't been doing any military videos uh, lately. I've been having a lot on my plate doing stuff. Um, but yeah, a lot of stuff to do. Um, but yeah, without further ado, I will kind of get on to the video. So, this video will be a military history lesson all about webbing. The British Army's um, essentially you know, webbing equipment that they've been wear wearing for many, many years. So, um, the British Army, well, if we kind of, if we start back to when the British Army was first ever formed as the British Army, um, by, well, in 1661, or, no, sorry, 1662, by King James the First or King James II, um, the British Army was wearing leather, leather bandoliers of powder, um, to, you know, arm their matchlock, um, uh, muskets, or, well, yeah, matchlock muskets. Um, so, right up through the Napoleonic era, right, pardon me, <coughs> through the Napoleonic era, and right through the, you know, the South African Wars, the British Army had been using leather equipment, leather webbing, uh, because it was far easier to get than any other material. And that's why they use it for many, many years. So, um, the last of the or last of the um, leather webbing equipment, uh, sorry, leather equipment, was the 1903 pattern um, leather bandolier equipment. Now, the 1903 pattern bandolier um, leather is very famous in you know and how kind of how to tell it apart is because there's a, a big, great leather bandolier strapped around your chest, or strapped across your chest, really, that which holds the um, throw three ammunition. And now, it was the reason why it was the last, the 1903 pattern leather uh, equipment was the last, is because leather um, in the heat can essentially go hard and crack, and that's, and that's that for your leather, you know, for your leather equipment, it's, you know, broken, there's no need for it. Um, so that's, you know, a problem. And also, it was very hot. Leather can really kind of burn and crisp up and get really dry and, as I say, crack and get you very uncomfortable when wearing it. So, um, after the 1903 pattern, bandolier um, um, leather webbing had subsided, or just a year later, essentially, um, a bloke called Mr John Burroughs, or Mr Burroughs, uh, went over to see the, the, the boys at the British Army Council and kind of showed them um, ideas for his new idea of actual webbing material for the British Army to wear as their equipment. And they so, and the Army Council, essentially, British Army Council, uh, accepted the idea. And so they said, Mr Burroughs, you can get yourself down to London. I believe it was London. But get yourself down to... And the Mills Equipment Company, um, which he did so, um, and so he presented his ideas, was in his idea, to the uh, Mills Equipment Company, who manufactured it, manufactured it, sorry, and tested it. Um, and how they tested it is they slung up a male mannequin to wear, and they and he that guy wore the new webbing equipment to see how durable it was, dropped him and he was you know, perfectly fine um, and so what they well they hang him upside down sorry and they dropped him and how they and the reason why they did that was to test the durability and if everything would stay together essentially and the test results came back quite positive and so in 1908 the Mills Equipment Company kind of um, patented and the British Army first adopted it and that equipment uh, in 1908 was called the Mills Burroughs equipment or later to be called the 1908 pattern webbing set infantry equipment which that is and now um, it's of course much more durable to leather webbing because it's it's proper webbing woven material and that means it won't crack in the heat or dry or anything it's actually 
not, not breathable in the heat, but actually nicer to wear in the heat. And of course, the cold, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't get frostbite, essentially, what the, uh, what the leather used to get, and crack up and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, that's the 1908 pattern webbing set. Um, it was the first with this great big, much nicer securing buckle. So essentially this, uh, if you don't know, this uh, part of the belt goes through there, down that buckle and then secures. And that's um, essentially much better than the older uh, um, 1903 pattern, which was literally just a leather belt with a, a snake uh, essentially hook to uh, hook them together. So this is what the British Army used right through the First World War, right through the Second World War, uh, into the early 1920s. Then some Commonwealth countries like Australia still wore the 1908 pattern webbing for ceremonial and actual training purposes um, by time, well this is just as the Second World War, just as the Second World War was getting underway, um, as of course the British Army had changed their webbing uh, in 1937, but I'll get on to that later uh, on later sorry um so and also um some countries as i say still use them in training purposes as well um so that's the 1908 pattern webbing set had oh sorry great big hook, uh, loops on the back for your sporting straps there as well so that's that as i said used right for the first world war through the 1920s when you're policing, when the British Army were policing India and other countries like that, China and everything. Um, sorry. So yeah, that's the Mills Burroughs equipment or what we really call today is the 1908 pattern webbing set. Now, in the British Army, or in the Armed Forces, sorry, you also get other services like the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force. So, um, so the Royal Navy had been using the 1908 pattern webbing set for, as I say, quite a long time since 1908. But after the First World War, they wanted to be, um, they wanted to have their own separate contracted webbing, and that was the 1919 pattern naval webbing. So really, um, how um, how you can identify one is just think of a 1937 pattern webbing belt um, with um, on one of the mills hooks and loop fastens there for an M uh, a, a, sorry an N for navy or naval um, kind of stamped into the, one of the, the loops and uh, on the back they have the standard bracing support hoops but they also have extra hoops, um, if I remember correctly, on the bottom or the top. But they do have extra hoops. Essentially, that's how you can tell the part, tell the difference. Pardon me, but that was the 1919 pattern naval equipment, mm -hmm. um, so which I don't actually have, which I would like to get one, but I don't actually have. <coughs> but yeah, so um, when the Royal Air Force um, essentially was modernizing their ways and their doabouts um, before it was became the Royal Air Force it was the Royal Flying Corps so the Royal Flying Corps <coughs> was um, uh, nine, is in April 1912 um, was founded by the British Army that's why they used the Royal Flying Corps used the same you know no stripes private one stripe Lance corporal two stripes corporal etc uh, rank stripes or ranks as the British Army but on the 1st of April 1918, um, the, Royal, the Royal Flying Corps am am amalgamated, merged, um, joined together with the Royal Navy Air Service to create the, um, you know, the world's first independent air force, meaning independent, meaning they've got their own rank structures, their own ways about, and that was the RAF, or the Royal Air Force. And now in 1925, the Royal Air Force wanted to kind of modernise a bit and actually have their first bit of proper webbing set and that was the 1925 pattern REF webbing set and this was this there well can't really get it up but it's that it's a bit thin
fiddly all this. There, I'll do that. Um, and now, in um, when the 1919 Naval set um, came out, um, it was the first ever patented webbing where it has the Mills hook and loop system, which is that. I can try and hook it over. Which, which, sorry, I probably can't. There. There. So the Mills hook and loop system first patented in 1919, and that was on the first on the 1919 naval um, Wedding set, which essentially was a simple, which the British Army to some extent used today, which is a simple buckle, hoops and look, look lock, sorry, into that buckle, and it had been for many years, and so many different types of that design was copied through the years, um, there by many countries. So this specific one is the 1919 pattern naval set, um, and now. Again, to tell the difference between the both, is the one difference, really the main difference, is on the side here, you've got two press studs. Yep. And those press studs there and there are for connecting the, which are very, quite rare today, really rare, uh, rarer than the belt, I would say, is the 1925 uh, pattern bayonet frog for your 1908 pattern um, bayonet which they essentially look like a 1937 pattern webbing, RF webbing um, frog, but you have on the, um, when the loop is looped around, you also have a press stud which presses into there, so it's kind of uh, really secure, essentially. So that's the um, 1919 pattern, um, sorry, <clears throat> that's the 1925 pattern RAF um, belt there, which has weirdly gone very dark, in this room now. I don't know if I have to do. Weird. But yeah. Um, so yeah, 1925 pattern REF webbing, their first bit of webbing. That's that. So now, um, the British Army in 1936 um, essentially modernised the British Army. They, you know, they got rid of things like the um, the National Defence Company and things like 19. 36 mod really modernized the army and the RAF was really um, really basically a fortune teller <laughs> as that as well I'll tell you that would be another video as well um, but in 1937 the, the British army um, adopts um, another set of webbing which was the very formidable very famous 1937 pattern webbing set here oops sorry there and um, it still retains the hook and loop system like every 1937 pattern style or every pattern webbing of belt wood and this would be used right through the 19 uh, f well the second world war right through the 19 um, 50s and not much really to say about this apart from the 1925 pattern here had the uh, press studs, but these, they got rid of them because they didn't need to have them, because there was just no point, it was, a, it was a waste of brass essentially, but what it, my one doesn't have, it should have the, uh, well if you get the 1925 pattern here, it should have the two um, buckles either end, which it doesn't on my one sadly, it's missing one, but yeah that's the 1937 pattern. British Army webbing set or belt essentially which as I say the British Army used right through Second World War 1950s but and somewhat into the 1960s as well. Now um, this isn't really along the lines of um, kind of infantry webbing essentially but there's another uh, so essentially as the British Army were uh, after the end after VE Day, 8th of May 1945, in what was called the Continuation War, or the War in the Far East against Japan, but in Burma uh, and Rangoon and that area, um, where it kind of heated up a lot. Pardon me. Um, 
And so the British Army in 1944 had what was called the Lethbridge Mission. So a guy called Colonel Lethbridge uh, went over with um, and basically tested a lot of different webbing because they found out that the 1937 pattern webbing, um, which was being used, you know, all of the time essentially in the Far East, used to used to rot in the in the, the heat and the climate. So, what they came out with was the 1944 pattern webbing, which was the first, which was kind of your tropical uh, webbing, your first proper tropical webbing, the 1944 pattern webbing which I will cut the video because it's on a mannequin at the moment and I'll show you for it on the mannequin. So this is the 1944 pattern webbing or the tropical webbing which was introduced in 1945 be precisely. Now um, as I say the 1937 pattern webbing um, tended to rot in the in the far east in the heat so when they so when Lethbridge and the tests subjects essentially came back they found out that this webbing um, was perfectly fine in the um, in the jungles of Burma but it was never ever used or sorry never ever worn ever at all in Burma or at the end of the Second World War it wasn't at, when the war actually ended in 1945 and 1946 um, well, no, when the war actually ended in 1945 and then a year later in 1946, they started to prop properly adopt these. So the 1944 pattern webbing, and this is actually on my Malaya uh, 1950 mannequin. If so, if you want me to do a video of that, um, I'll be glad to do it. I'll be doing a video on that. So um, 1944 pattern webbing adopted in 1945. Now the difference really is they actually copied um, off the American um, 90 of the the American model 1936 uh, belt which had the eyelets so you could fit a kind of the the, can, the more modern at the moment canteen which had the American um, kind of lo lo loop system which loops in there and around or that way um, it had this little press stud here which essentially when you're slinging your rifle over your shoulder you you stock of your butt would go in there and then that would secure the rifle when you're on a long march without it flapping about. Um, it had a, you know, like every other webbing belt I've shown you, it has a two-point attachment for the brace. It actually has a six-point, so I can't really show you, but on the behind here, it's got the, the usual supporting straps for the braces, and then either side it's got these little uh, braces, Ooh, you can't see it, but there which are for another attachment. So essentially, it you get the brace and then you've got a little bit kind of hanging off the side and that's what these go into. So that's the 1944 pattern, tropical webbing, first properly introduced in 1946 post-war years and used in Malaya and, and Borneo in the 1950s and 60s. So that's that. Now, in 1958, the regular British Army had adopted a new pattern of webbing and that's the 1958 pattern webbing set and now by this time you know Malaya conflict uh, emergency is still going on and so the 1944 pattern webbing uh, the tropical webbing was still being used and being used um, would be still used sorry throughout the 1960s as well um, but the regular British Army wanted to adopt another webbing, which again was this, the 1958 pattern webbing. Um, and it was the last of the actual proper webbing materials. Um, then later on, they would, you know, in the kind of 80s, would go on to, um, or 70s, 80s, you would go on to see more of a, um, a plasticky sort of um, kind of material being used um, for that. But how this one works is um, if we get a 1925 pattern RF belt here, you see you've got the supporting straps there for the braces. Yep, the 1958 pattern belt uses the um, uses the the old um, 58 pattern 
um, um, how would you call it, the um, 1958 pattern uh, brace extensions, which essentially the brace would come down to there, so the brace would come down to there, and then the extensions would clip on there like that to there. They would use that, but these little hoops at the bottom, like that, yeah, uh, would actually be used to carry your um, your um, kind of poncho at the which poncho roll mac would be at the bottom or your um, bottom. Um, so yeah, this nineteen fifty eight pattern webbing set would be continue to be used. Pardon me, throughout the sixties, throughout the seventies, with the DPM uniforms, and would phase out by the nineteen eighties and nineteen nineties. So, if you guys have uh, liked this video, sorry for the shaky and dark parts and terrible, um, you know, judders of the camera. Um, sorry about that. So yeah, um, thanks for watching, guys. Have a good one, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.